Theodor from your list for you. Today I would like you to introduce you into the concept of an anthroposophical based stress release, stress reduction. I'm busy with this theme together with Dr. Harald Haas in Switzerland since about 10 years and we are running courses in his practice in the anthroposophical branch and also online on Eurism for You. And my intention is to encourage you to try these exercises for yourself. Uh, they are published, the document, so you can find it. There's a course on Eurism for You, you can follow yourself. Or what I would like to do is uh, offer a group course which could start in the second half of April if you want to do it together with me, I will tell you more about that at the end of this session. This picture reminds you of stress, I think. But if you look at it, there are different aspects uh, showing different people, different things. And if we go through them, we touch these things Rudolf Steiner has spoken about in 1912 in his lecture, Overcoming Nervousness. And there he said, there's always a lot of objection to the fact that we speak of a differentiation of the human being into four members, the physical body, the either or life body, the astral body, and the I. However, it must be emphasized that if you apply this differentiation, differentiation to life, it can prove to be remarkably useful. And it will soon be found that these benefits can gradually bring about a kind of conviction of what is available through clairvoyant observation. So Jürgen Steiner then stresses two things. If you apply this knowledge, you will benefit from it in your everyday life. But through this, you get a sort of inner sensation, inner perception of what's behind the exercises and you start also to, to can draw from this level and to be nourished, nourished from this level and to be, become more secure that you are carried by higher forces too. Let's go into the different aspects Rudolf Steiner suggested. One thing he suggested, try to hide objects from yourself. Put your toothpaste in the cupboard in the evening and look if you find them back in the morning. He said, change your handwriting. I'll tell you more about this later, some experiences. Another suggestion he made was Try to think in reversed order. If you have a poem, can you think it backwards? If you have a melody in mind, can you try to sing it backwards? A tune that you do it. If you have a telephone number, can you say these things backwards? Now, the next thing he suggested is observe yourself. As if you would be a second person, watch yourself, how do you move, how do you tie your shoelaces. Look at yourself from the outside. And he suggested change habits, do it playfully. Yeah? Not just all the bad habits, but just things you usually do this way, just do them the other way around. Like this lady who has her feet on the cushions of the bed and the head is at the end of the bed. The next suggestion he made was refrain from little wishes. So if you have a little wish, just say no, not at the moment, maybe later. And do these sort of things. Just don't follow what you wish at the moment. The next suggestion was weigh up your decisions. What speaks for it, what speaks against it. And then make your decision consciously and then carry it out with this consciousness in mind. And the 
last suggestion was refrain from criticism. We criticize such a lot, don't criticize. 10% would be okay, criticism is necessary, something is not right, but we criticize automatically much, much more often than is necessary. But he also suggests don't just not don't just not criticize, but if somebody is aggressive against you, then normally we react with the criticism of his not his mind is crazy, something like this. But think about what's going on with him, what's behind him, is he or she under pressure? And in this way we refrain from criticism. These seven, eight exercises he described in this order. Hiding objects from yourself, changing handwriting, thinking in reverse, changing habits, self-observation, dealing with wishes, weighing up decisions, and refraining from criticism. When he describes these exercises, one realizes, oh, there's an order behind it. And Rudolf Steiner himself Every exercise says what it does. The first three exercises, he says, they strengthen the etheric body. When with these changing habits and self-observation exercises, he said, that's strengthening the astral body. And all the time when he described one of the following exercises, he said, that's strengthening the eye, that's strengthening your will. And it doesn't mean the personal will, oh, I want this, I want that, but the I, the will, is this force in us, which, what do I really want? And then your soul and your body can much easier follow, because they also say, yes, that's what you really want, that can be support with joy. Yeah, that's when he says, but oh, that's strengthening your I, your will forces. Normally one knows from this lecture that that's the exercise that Rudolf Steiner speaks about. But in the introduction, before he explains the exercises, he goes through an order of diseases or problems or whatever, yeah, unhealthy attitudes, uh, which occur nowadays so often. And we put them a little bit more into the language of today how it's used today, so it's a little bit different from how Rudolf Steiner expresses it, but in principle he describes in the introduction those problems. Let's start at the left side, it's forgetfulness, we all suffer from forgetfulness. He speaks from jumpiness, anxiety which is around. We are, our skin is so thin and it describes people who cannot start entering their body because it's not the strength isn't there. He describes the self-doubt and the, the burnout question. Then he describes, he calls it then political alcoholism, where you just don't know what to do anymore, you just talk, 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 and decision-making is so difficult. The restlessness and the loss of control, which you also experience today, perhaps. Then he speaks of the psychosomatic. He also uses, not this word, but he describes the illnesses which come from out the soul, yeah? And the addictiveness, the addictions we suffer from, many of us, because we don't know how to fulfill what we really are looking for. And this compulsion and indecision that we follow the advice of others and not our own will, and this being hunted by thought, with the thoughts just circling our head, and you cannot stop them anymore. And in a way, when you look at this, you can say that's the whole spectrum of different kinds of nervousness, which are around everywhere, but also in us. Some more, some less, but I think we all know all of those, those things. The interesting thing is that Rudolf Steiner went in his introduction, not in this order he just went through, but he began at the end with being hunted by thoughts, with compulsion, psycho psychosomatic issues, restlessness of control, self touch jumpiness, forgetfulness. And then you realize that in the introduction he, then, he described the problems in this direction, 
And then he gives suggestions the other way around. He goes the way back again. And that's an interesting um, motif. And there's a background behind it. But before we go to that, I go through the exercises once again that you can, just with the memory, you really have to bring things, you just try to perceive it and you really take it in, take yourself time that they're really right. When you do the handwriting exercise, Dr. Steiner suggests, do it at least for 15 minutes. And then it's maybe 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, you're really tired, I must go to bed now. You are ready to go to bed and then you remember yourself, remind yourself, oh, I still have to do my handwriting exercise, 15 minutes. And then you start. And now I just show you what, how my, my handwriting, that's my notebook from January. I was in Canada traveling, it was a nice experience. And that's how my handwriting looks like. Yeah? It's... Uh, and it wouldn't be so easy for me to change it, right? More beautiful. Then I'm tired, I want to go to bed, and I do this handwriting exercise, and the exercise is not right as beautiful as possible. The exercises change one or two things. For example, make, I choose, chose to make one let the first letters very big. Maybe I do it like this. And the other small, and instead of a point on top of a, a, le a letter, I make a circle. And just writing like this, can you see? The handwriting had changed completely. Not the way I intended it to be, it just happened. Or I did it this way, that uh, I chose to, to write it very narrow, that, or, or very far from each other, the letters. But each time, the handwriting became beautiful. I was tired. I did not intend to write. I just changed a few things. And that's just to see that these, these exercises, we touch deep layers in us. Because this inner wisdom of beauty, just because I make space for it, and I address it in a way this system likes, can evolve, can, can make itself visible, and the beauty which lives in us suddenly becomes active, which very often is suppressed. I don't go through everything now, but you see these exercises touch layers in us which are not in front in everyday life. That's what anthroposophy speaks about, that we have a physical body, a life body, a soul body, which really let us live on earth and the soul which lives in this body. And then we, we speak about that there's also a spirit and this spirit also has sort of layers. There's a spirit self which is still very close to me. It has a lot to do with my personality. But there's a life spirit which uh, in a way is a broader consciousness which takes cares for my development. And the spirit man is in a way my aspect of my spiritual being, which is related to the whole being of man, our common uh, evolution, in a way. Not so easy to speak about it. What is it? Is it true that these things exist? And how do they live in us? And that's the idea that if we work on these exercises, we become can become clearer how these layers in us work and uh, can also start a communication with them and gain strength out of this encounter and learn about ourselves. I want to say hello to Monica who is supporting me in the background and con collecting the questions and putting them forward if there are any. Do you do one exercise per day? You can do it the way you want to do it. In the beginning, to, to connect with the exercise, it's good to do one exercise for about a week. And people who run with us through the course, 
very often after a week they say, oh, what a pity, you now I've just started to get a grip on it, oh, I would like to go on with it. Let's do it two weeks. And then you have to decide what time span is appropriate for you. Do you like it? So do you go on? Just, oh, I have got a grip on it, I go to the next one. But that's in a way a good thing to start with, to get a hold of it. And when you are used to it, you can combine them, you can change it every day uh, if you want to, or even put them in a composition which is you can do within a day. I will bring one more aspect to this question a little bit later, where the daily aspect is emphasized. Thinking in reverse is not clear to me what kind of thoughts uh, thinking in reverse is an exercise which one easily does not like because it's quite an effort. What and you can use a tele in the beginning you can use a telephone number and just go through the numbers in the opposite order backwards. Or what I like to do is, I take a sentence out of a meditation and then start to think it word for word backwards. If you go into these sentences and you do the other way around, you will be surprised that they change their meaning. So in this simple exercise, you can have again different layers. You have this effort of just managing it. You even have the effort to just even start it. But then you can reach a layer where these aha words start to unfold in a different way and you get even present back out of it. Okay? Is there any exercises that help with panic attacks? Is are there any exercises which help with panic attacks? Uh, then I we have done this course from last April to June with 50 participants and quite a few of them wrote feedback to us, I show, I show them to you afterwards and one person has written to me an email, she said I couldn't go shopping anymore, I didn't dare to. And now I have exercises which help me, I can't go shopping again. So in a way my answer is I would not look for a single exercise, but this series is because in one problem always many things interfere which is which is other. But if you go through this this sequence, yeah, you you work on this interrelationship and the inner stability starts to grow. So I would not look for one exercise, but which ones of this order really help me. And it's a little bit a thing of trying it out. Yeah? You will respond to the different exercises differently. I mentioned at the beginning that Rudolf Steiner has described the problems in the reversed order as he gave the exercises. And what's behind the, how the Steiner started to speak about these things, about the nervousness of our times. And out of the work with Haratas, and it was the discovery of Haratas, he discovered it's actually the Eightfold Path, which is working as a spiritual background behind these exercises. The Eightfold Path uh, founded or, in the, or conceived by Gautama Buddha 600 years before Christ. And Rudolf Steiner uh, just put, told his students how important this path is and he even brought it into contemporary words but they are still pretty close to the original words of Buddha. So just you can easily compare it when you read his texts and the texts which are available on, on, on the internet, for example. And when you look on the Eightfold Path, 
And now it starts with the right hand side, the right opinion, the right judgment, the right speech, the right deed, the right attitude, the right striving, the right memory. Right is not meant in a way, oh, what is it right or wrong, but is it, does it fit to me? Is it, is it what lives in me? Is it what is really needed? Yeah? Not what do others say. On the contrary, it's the path towards myself. Now we start again at the left. The right memory and hiding things from yourself to strengthen your memory that's related to each other. The right striving and the changing handwriting. You have seen what the changing handwriting can bring up. Yeah? So there is a relationship. The right attitude that's behind this point of the Eightfold Path, there is this, can I combine my spiritual being with my earthly one? Can I live with this contradiction? And exact this contradiction, this way, but also the other way, have it in mind. That's exactly the thinking in reverse. The right deed, the heart part of the Eightfold Path, the observing myself and changing habits, can I perceive what is needed and how can I be so flexible? Yeah, the heart is a thing of flexibility that I can respond to what is needed to help. The right speech, it's about do I always have to say what I want to say, what I need to say, or can I keep it back? That's exactly the same thing as I want to have a cup of coffee, or no, I can wait for 10 minutes, or I take it this afternoon, just to play with myself. Can I keep it back? The right judgment and the weighing up decision, it's exactly the same description in both in a way, and the right opinion, what do I think about what I need, and refraining from criticism from the personal standpoint, from the personal standpoint to a more objective standpoint. You realize in a way that the exercises against nervosity are a sort of practical application of the Eightfold Path. Just the other way around. The Eightfold Path is more the spiritual aspect, this direction. The exercises against nervosity, practical application, everyday life. Ordinary questions, the other way around. That's the same approach as Buddhas in a way. Steiner went in one thing, he went a little bit further. He suggested, or he attributed the days of the week to the Eightfold Path. He said, do the right opinion on Saturday, the right judgment on Sunday, right speech on Monday, and so on. We know that the days of the week, the Sunday is attributed to the sun, the Monday to the Moon, the Saturday to Saturn, the uh, Tuesday to Zeus, yeah, the, the Mars God, and so on. So there are the forces of the planets behind, and they can be all connected with the qualities of the sounds. And that's where your rhythmy can come in. Saturday you. Sunday Au, Monday I, Mardi, Mars, uh, Tuesday A, E, Wednesday Mercury, Mercury, uh, Thursday Jupiter Day, uh, the O, and the Venus Freya's Day, the Friday, the R, the open gesture of the R. That's not just an um, uh, an idea, but a sort of a reality behind it. That is uh, just refraining from criticism in a way to combine this with this gesture or the feeling. It's not just the outward gesture, but this feeling of the U. And in a way, I can connect with the infinity. Yeah? I make a parallel gesture, which I try to explain that it comes far from above, behind goes through my heart and reaches the infinity there. In a way, I am here, but in a way, I'm trans 
It's just one aspect, and we all as many, I mean, a way transparent for for the space in the periphery. It's not I. It's through me, but then becoming aware of this. So this right opinion and the ill gesture. The owl, for example, when you do the judgment, the judgment is such a lot to do with what do I have to do with the left and the right? Yeah? And do I have the inner power to, to really decide and then to go with it? And if we look deeper into it, in the course, then we can notice the head never can decide because the head, if you have an argument for this, the head defined must has to find an argument that can do it, think it this way too. And then the, only the heart can decide. So, and the sun, yeah, the owl is the heart energy. And then in the owl you can practice, can I be very strong, send a lot of energy out there in the periphery, I go a little bit more back, but in a way that my heart is strong and centered. So something is sent out, but my heart is strengthened by what I'm doing. Yeah? And the sun and the planets, you know, the sun is so strong, the planets exactly follow what they do. And the moon gesture, the, the eye, can I come towards myself or do I lose myself? Well, the eye is a gesture where you could easily lose yourself. It's just touching, feeling yourself. But if you really go into it, then you start touching yourself, or touching something, and, and this is leading you towards your inside, you will notice you really arrive within, and you are not drawn out. Yeah? Life is all these little wishes. And so it goes on and on. All these letters have a sort of specific relationship with the task, we try to fulfill the exercise we try to pursue in this days, in this week. When you look at it now, what I've done, I've just put it together, what I have spoken about. You have in the green part, in the light part on top, the, the energy of the eight-foot path with its sounds. And you have the exercises we do underneath. And you have the, the effect on the body, yeah, or the problems you are working on in the bottom part, yeah, and the, the members of the body that the, they build the, the base for everything, yeah. And on top, if we work like this with the hiding objects from ourselves, we strengthen our memory. If we change the handwriting, we work on our life body and we foster well-being, being and resilience. If we practice thinking in re reverse, which is connected to the I, yeah, to the E, yeah, we overcome self-doubt, burnout, we work on our soul body and st strengthen our self-confidence. If we change habits in a playful way, if we practice self-observation in a playful way, way we, we, we strengthen our flexibility and self-awareness. We broaden the spectrum of our soul. If we practice dealing with wishing, this with, with wishes, yeah, we start to work on our inner aspects, on our spiritual aspects. We, we start a way which leads towards ourselves and we strengthen our self-assertiveness. With weighing up decisions, we learn to decide with the heart. And with refraining from criticism, we practice to rest in ourselves. And that's the complete picture. And that's a little bit the question also, do I have work on one exercise specifically? And my opinion is, or my, what I think or feel is, if we practice all of them in a way, they start to play into each other. And what comes out of it is not just the strengthening memory and the self-confidence, but we also learn to develop this inner security to spiritual truth, to what we in our innermost being know, but somehow don't, don't dare to believe.
but don't dare to act from what we do feel. Yeah, so that's the picture of these exercises, the interconnection. There are even more aspects into it. We will look at them when we, when we practice, because that makes sense to, to, to use our experience to deepen our inner knowledge. Yes, now I am open to more questions. What is the difference between soul body and soul? The soul body and soul? I go back to my presentation. Then I have something to hold on. If you look at these bodies down there, the physical body, life body, soul body, that's in a way the precondition for us that we can live on earth. We need a body, a physical body, a body, and that's not just a material body, it's more a knowledge body, who knows if a hand of a human being has five fingers. And if I have a scarf here, the scarf doesn't belong to there, an arm looks like that. And all, all this inner knowledge, what is our body like, that's the physical body, all the experience of evolution is in our body. And the life body, in a way, is the body who works, that lets this body grow, who cares for this body, who makes it possible that the scarf goes away, but the physical body tells the life body, I don't want to have it here. The soul body, in a way, is, has a lot to do with a receptive that our body allows us to perceive. If, it's, if you don't perceive the surroundings, if our eyes are closed, it's much harder to be in the body. I need a rich, set life, a sensual life. And that's a body for the soul. So the sensual life, life experiences, body experience, these make it possible that I can fully live in my body. And that makes it possible that my soul can fully live in my body. If I take somebody all senses away, it's much more difficult for the soul to penetrate the body. It would need much more energy. And in the soul, that's I, I try to, to, to show underneath, there live the I, the, my being. I express myself through the soul thinking, feeling, willing. I have different aspects. I have the sensitivity towards the outer world. How do I relate to what I sense? But I have also a sensitivity towards my inner being. How do I want to be? Or what's behind the things? Can I look at a tree that I do not only feel what it looks like, but what lives in the tree? That's more the consciousness, the being aspect. Then I'm completely in me. I can also be there. So this is the wide range of the soul which can um, move through everything. Why only seven rites in Eightfold Path? Hmm. It's just because I didn't draw the eighth one. <laughs> uh, I stopped the slide presentation. The Eightfold Path has eight members and the, 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 the eighth one is the, the state of present, the right meditation. Yeah? So you have the seven steps, like seven planets, for example, and then you have this thing which uh, encompasses everything. And the, the right meditation, the right attitude, depending on how you translate it. And actually, in the nervousness exercises, there's also the eighth state. I have I must explain it. So after these seven parts, if you take the red one, which I doubled up in a way, there's also this encompassing week. That's why I suggest we do nine weeks. That in the last week, it's how can I combine everything? That in a way, this inner trust comes about. Yeah? How can I not do just one exercise, but how can I be a complete being? So both. Passes. The spiritual way, 
with the eightfold path has eight members and the nervousness exercises also have eight members. You're right. More questions? Yes. According to your presentation, can Arismi and Vowel, vowel gestures replace somehow the Steiner's exercises? I mean, instead of doing hiding objects, can I do a A gesture? It's a good question. And I actually was very happy to discover that the Eurythmy part can be combined with the everyday exercises. I experience a little bit like man and woman, that you know, or a friend and I, that a, a two-ness in a way can start a dialogue. So if I say, oh no, I don't want to hide objects, I rather do the A, in a way I start to feel, oh, because what we try to do is the task of us human beings is to work ourselves through our bodies. We do not come down to earth to bounce back into heaven again, but we come down to earth to, to work ourselves through the mud and come out the other side, happy and strong and I have made it, or we have made it. Well, they can't do it alone, but we will make it. That's why I would suggest to combine it, and the human being is the contradictory way. So we are there and there. So in a way, this combination actually uh, expresses, in a way, also an aspect of the human being to live in two worlds. Okay. One more, One more question, then I go on and then we start think about slowly concluding that we don't take more than one hour, maybe even less to finish. Can you again expand what the exercise dealing with wishes, wishes is? The exercise dealing with wishes, uh, you can read all these explanations in this lecture for the Steiner. I give you um, a link to an online platform, an anthroposophical one, where you can download this PDF and read it. And there, Sudo Steiner expl expresses a lot about this exercise. I cannot go into details now. But dealing with wishes, in a way, is the question. In, in the practical thing, it's very easy. We just observe how many wishes you all the time have without notice, even noticing them. You do this and you do that. Always, oh, I make a coffee, I do this. I put the radio on just to fulfill a need which I even, I'm, even, I'm not even conscious of. So the first step is to become conscious of all these little wishes we have. And not to fulfill the little wishes, it's just to become even more conscious of them, to start a dialogue with them. So I do not take coffee this morning. I do not switch on the radio for breakfast today. I see these beautiful shoes in the windows of this shop. They are so beautiful. I'm not going to buy them today. I come back tomorrow. Just imagine what you saw. I don't know if you're women and men are a little bit different in, sh in these matters, but what your soul does when you say, oh, will they still be there tomorrow? Yes, and let's take it as a game. Huh? If you really need those, those shoes, you should buy them, but if you, you can use it to have this game. And that's very important in this exercise, that you do not use it to change something, an addiction you have. Oh, I want to stop smoking, and now this week I learn to stop smoking. Then you lose this playful dialogue with you, and this way through the body that we learn that our body, the lower system, is a playful system which likes to play, and only feels understood when you play with it. That's an important aspect, not only in this exercise, but in all exercises, and it's especially important in the last three ones. We will do this dealing with wishes, the thinking, deciding exercise, 
and this resting with yourself exercise because so often you won't succeed and then just laugh about it, don't give up and enjoy not to su succeed, for example. Good. We can have one more or stop. So, great. I have answered the questions which we could pick up. Maybe we missed one or two, so I apologize. And I want to invite you, because this idea of offering a course which we could do together with these exercises, originally I planned for the autumn. I wanted to do some webinars like this one, after just before summer and then start in the autumn. But now times have changed. And so many of us feel in a little in a way challenged what is the, what are the real values? How can I and you cannot do your rhythm all the time, but to do these little exercises, you can so easily do and play with it through, throughout the day and you touch very important things of yourself which can strengthen you in your decision making and your, in your everyday um, life questions. We did a scientific evaluation and the every day or every after every week they answered the questionnaire and in the end, after the eight weeks, it was an eight week course then, I asked them, why would you recommend the AVXR course to other people? So they took just this online course, module for module, and I was not explaining anything. And this online course has a description of the exercise, there are videos which explain the exercise in the background, and there are videos which explain the rhythmic. I love this course because it allows me to feel my body and to capture perceptions using the heuristic movements. The everyday exercises are thought-provoking tasks that help me to make everyday life positive. It broadens my horizons, providing a lot of helpful exercises. It's the first course I've done online and it was very good. I will repeat it, repeat it at any time. Number four, I leave because it's so long. Just number five, for another example, for me it's the best and most complete guidance and exercise series I've ever used to get from my head to heart listening view of the world. It helped me experience my ego in the body and also in interaction with the forces of the surroundings. In today's troubled and uncertain times, it is a great help for me to re-establish the already almost forget, forgotten basic trust. I read it not to, it's, I don't think it's, it's not my or our invention, these exercises. I just read it to you and give you this feedback to encourage you to do these exercises. And just maybe you take, take this lecture for the Steiner if you want to and follow these exercises. Or you buy this one, this APSR course on our website and do it for yourself or you join the group. But I'm very sure if you work with these exercises, you will profit from them.